the good news is we're all in this together and when we see we're together Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was going to say famous. <laughs> Should I stand up and take a bow? <laughs> Every day I get up early and, and go to the internet and find the news about uh, climate change and energy, and I put anything that I find that's interesting into a, a 50 word or so synopsis, c combine it with a link to the original source. I put 10 to 15 of these up every day on a blog which is called geoharvey.com, named after me, by the way. I didn't know that. It didn't. <laughs> <laughs> geoharvey, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. And uh, we will try to keep you apprised of what date our articles are, were posted on. So you can go there, click on that date on the, ca on the calendar that you see, and be led to a place where you don't have to scroll through very many articles before you find the one you're looking for. And before we start, maybe I should talk about this thing. Okay? Can't dance. This is, this is cool. This, this is cool. This, is this really thing nice. here is a computer. And I just got it, and um, I'm planning on using it. It's about the same size as a pack of Marlboros. Yeah, I haven't seen a pack of Marlboros, at least not in my hands, for quite a long time. But this thing, I, I say it's kind of like a thick pack of cards. This computer has no monitor or keyboard attached, so of course you have to attach those. You have to attach a, um, a power supply. The first computer I worked with had no keyboard or monitor. It was... So, uh, we're, we're, so we're going back in time. We're going back in time to about 48 years ago. This computer is about 60,000 times as fast, and it has about 120,000 times as much memory. <laughs> it, it uses two watts of power. That computer was big enough that it occupied an entire apartment, and you needed three air conditioners to cool it off because it, it used so much Oh, yeah, power. I remember that. When I was it in college, the computer building was a building all by itself. Yeah. It had one computer. In yeah. It. The, the computer that I worked on, the first computer I worked on, was the second computer ever to be installed in a liberal arts college. It cost $1.5 million used. <laughs> this thing, in its kind of stripped-down uh, stripped mode, which would not include the case, but just the board inside, costs $35. Wow. The, the reason I'm yeah the reason I'm bringing that up and and the the most um, simple that's a very powerful little thing it's very powerful yeah it's it's as powerful as my Windows Seven machine was about six years ago okay and this thing in its most stripped down version is about the size of a of a stick of gum and has uh, 512 megabytes of RAM on it and this thing but this this thing here has right there a um, 16 gigabyte hard drive that's about as big as your thumbnail. A little that's smaller. Exactly what, it's smaller than my thumbnail. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but that, the most stripped down version is about the size of a stick of gum and it costs five dollars. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and the reason I'm mentioning this is because it shows you what has happened to the, to the power of computers and the prices of computers and all of that over the years. Whose law is that? That's Moore's law, Moore's law. which is not ex really a law. Well, it's, a lot of it's just an observation, <laughs> but it's based on Wright's law, which is explained as a law, which says that when you're producing things, new things, as the as the use space increases, the efficiency of production increases, and the price goes down. And that Wright's law is a kind of a more clearly stated. Moore's Law that is more broadly applicable. And um, the reason I bring it up is because that's what's happening to solar power, to wind power, to batteries. And it is hard to see where all of this is going to go in the future, but we can, we can tell. And we're, by the way, today we're not going to talk about it on this show. We will talk about it on the next show. There was an auction in Mexico. The auction was won by the winning bids 
Two major projects were one by NL, which is a big Italian company, and their bids were to provide electricity from solar power for $17.70 per megawatt hour. Wow! That, for anybody who wants to know, is 1.77 cents per kilowatt hour. <laughs> Now, you wonder why we're spending so much money on electricity? It's because we're buying it from obsolete sources. Yeah. And Donald Trump, and of course a few other people, want us to continue buying it from obsolete sources. Yeah. That's what makes America great, <laughs> is the fact that we've got great big important people in it. I'm not going to go any further. <laughs> anyway, we start on, Jan on, on November 16th, which is a Thursday, and we start with well, starting off with a good one. An Jim. article from Clean Technica. We've got a picture here. We do. Yeah. yeah, let's start with the picture. Look at that thing, huh? Yeah, look at it. <laughs> that that's kind of amazing looking. This, by the way, we're starting off with a very good story. This this is this is this interesting is a story. Very interesting story. Interesting story. And I'll read the headline. Okay. Here. Cool Airbus Vahana project is ready for flight testing. <laughs> Vahana project. The Airbus Vahana project is ready for flight testing just as Boeing, Uber, and others jumping into the electric plane game and electric airplanes and other vertical takeoff and landing aircraft t taking off. The Airbus Vahana project says it will not need a runway, will be self-piloted. You don't have to know how to fly to fly this thing and it can automatically and detect obstacles and other aircraft. Well, this was something that if you're watching this show, I think you get a kick, of, kick out of picking, picking, picking up on this one and looking at it. Yeah. Lots of pictures. Yep. Uh, Lots there's a of video. Pictures. Unfortunately, yep. the wording is in German. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> and in addition, this came from Clean Technica, and there's a lot of top stories on Clean Technica this week that you find interesting too, some of whom we're, talking, we're yes. going to talk about here. Yes, right. Quick takeaway from this thing, and it basically confirms what you were saying. Recent advances in composite manufacturing mean lightweight vehicles can be produced at high volumes with low costs. That's what they're looking at and This here. again is Wright's Law. Absolutely. Know. Battery safety and energy density are now adequate enough for air flight. Amazing. This is about two years away from flying, yeah. and this particular model of the Vahana is for a single passenger. Yeah. And, you know, you, you dial something up on your telephone, this thing comes and picks you up, <laughs> you get in it, you tell it where you want to go, it and takes, it takes you, you there. there. <laughs> There's no pilot in it There's at no all. pilot. And in case you don't see it, those uh, propellers and wings all rotate. Oh, they all rotate, They yeah. pop up to take you up so, and down. So they're like helicopter uh, rotors. Well, ta that, that take vertical takeoff and landing yep. planes. Yeah. So and we've got some of them, and the yeah. British have some of them. Yep. So it's, it's progress, guys. It is. That's what it is. Let's move on okay. to the next one here. Our next article comes from Grist. Yeah, this is from Grift. Okay, mm -hmm. Grist. Grift. <laughs> Grift. <laughs> on again, off again. Yeah, well... Puerto Rico just met the halfway point in restoring power and the, lights, and the lights went out. Puerto Rico Governor Ricardo Rossello had just tweeted that power was back to 50% of utility customers when the outage hit San Juan. 56 days after Hurricane Maria, Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico is still experiencing the longest blackout in history, and we will have more to say about this. This, this, this is kind of interesting, because <laughs> this is from the article. Even where power has been restored, it keeps going out. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't know why. Well, well I can tell you why. It's because the whole system is a mess. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> for sure. Well, what happened in this case, a major 230 kV line had failed. Yeah. They don't quite know why. But and this is the second failure in less than a week. Yeah. And we've talked about this one. The high voltage transmission line had been repaired by Whitefish Energy. Yes. Which, if you've been following the oh. show, you know, we talked about And of about course, we're going to have more about Whitefish more about Ener Whitefish. Energy. And, and, but wh this Whitefish thing, really, I think there may be people going to prison over that. I don't think that, well, we'll get into it later. 
<laughs> it's a it's a bad system. Uh, it's really kind of incredible. I mean, they were they were listing the costs for different personnel, and it was three hundred and fifteen dollars an hour for a journeyman lineman. Good money if you could get it. Uh, that's <laughs> 315 a, bucks an hour. 315. They weren't paying the lineman that much. No, 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 no. That's how much <laughs> they were charging. My bet is that they were paying the lineman about 20. Eh, maybe a little more than that. You know, remember, they're in Puerto Rico. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, P Puerto Rico, by the way, the minimum wage is $4. Is it really? Everything that is brought from other parts of the United States has to have an import duty put on it. Which I think is absolutely outrageous. You know, how would you like it if Congress decided to have an import duty on the state of Vermont, so every Vermonter has to pay extra for anything that comes from New Hampshire? You know, I mean, really, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. Well, People should it's, understand it's been that. It's being systematically exploited. It's for a being long time. exploited. And, and so what do you do? You charge extra because the people down there don't have anything, and then you pay them less because they don't need as much. <laughs> They, they got don't it all figure it out, though. Yeah, they've got it all figured yeah. out. Obviously, they don't need anything. I mean, they don't even have electricity. Why would they need anything? Anyway, we should move on before yeah, I pop. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Our next item is from Reuters. Global <coughs> Alliance to phase out coal. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> At least 15 countries have joined an international alliance to phase out coal from power generation before 2030. Delegates at the UN climate talks in Bonn said on Thursday, the alliance aims to have 50 me members by the US, uh, next U.S. climate summit in 2018 to be held in Poland's Katowice, the one of Europe's most polluted cities. And by the way, that number of 15 grew to 25 the last time I looked, but that was a, several days ago. It, it may go further. People are getting on the bandwagon. They are. And by the way, that's pronounced Katowice. Katowice. Yeah, look I that should one have, up. I should, have, I should have done that myself. Well, according to the takeaway here, the world's biggest coal users, such as China, United States, Germany, and Russia, have not signed up, at least as of last week. Yes. However, some U.S. states... Canadian provinces and businesses have. Yeah. They're taking an end run around I noticed this. that Oregon had. Huh? Oregon had. <clears throat> the state of Oregon signed oh, up. Okay, California did. I didn't know that. I think so. <clears throat> but, you know, these are, uh, p uh, governments are uh, continuously signing up on this. I find it difficult to imagine that they aren't going to have 50 members by the next oh, time. I think, I think it's a and good And, of course, what, what is that going to do? It's going to cut the rug out from under the, the, the international uh, coal trading which means that if you want coal, it's probably going to be a glut on the market, but you shouldn't want it because the stuff is, I don't know. Well, you know, they don't talk much about the, they talk about the cost of coal. Yeah. But they don't talk about much about getting rid of the ashes, which they is don't, a cost. They don't talk about much about the, the cost of, of pollution from the coal. They, they don't talk anything about that. Yeah. They don't want us to even think about that. Yeah. But let's move along. We got... Uh, so, uh, some more pictures coming up. We here. do. We got at least one picture. We are now on Friday, February 17th, and that picture is a Tesla Roadster. Surprise. Surprise. Tesla Roadster 2 <laughs> unveiled. Lots of pictures in this article. Yeah, all, there are. All, all pictures of this thing. I well, want one. And you do, eh? <laughs> This is from Clean Technica. Elon Musk unexpectedly disappeared from the stage during the Tesla semi-truck unveiling, and then, to everybody's surprise, a Tesla Roadster 2 appeared. The base model will be the fastest production car ever made when it comes to market. This is the base market model in 2020. <laughs> yeah. Musk said the point of all this is just to ha give a hardcore smackdown to gasoline cars. Well, you know, we were just talking about Moore's Law. How come it hasn't happened to gasoline engines? Well, it, it's... Well, that because they're old technology. It already happened to the gas. Yeah, but not 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 hundred years not ago. Not so fast to, to such a degree. No, it did actually, and it happened when you could see it in action when Henry Ford lowered the 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 price of the model Model T. Uh huh. Okay, he he. I I forget what the cut was, but it was like a fifty percent cut or a seventy five percent cut or whatever in the price of the Model T, and simultaneously he. 
moved his working force from a, I think it was a 60-hour work week to a 48-hour work week and increased their salary by 100%. Well, <coughs> he explained it very simply, so I want my, my workers to be able to afford what they're building. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> and it changed America. It did. It really did. Yeah. A couple of quick takeaways here, the technical <coughs> ones. Zero to 60 in under. Two seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Quarter mile. Nine seconds. Nine seconds. Zero to 100. I don't remember. Four seconds. Four seconds. Okay, <laughs> zero to 100, four seconds. This, I hit the zero came, to 60 by in two seconds. This came this from was... Musk himself. Driving a gas sports car would be like driving a steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> and this car is going to have a 620-mile range. So you can yeah. go from San, San Fran to L.A. and back without recharging. I had a friend once who had a steam Did engine. You? Yeah, he had a Stanley <laughs> steamer. He loved it. Oh, Stanley Steamer. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. said it got 35 miles to a gallon of, of uh, number two fuel oil and you also a gallon of, of, um, of distilled water. Okay. And he said n nobody ever knew how fast those cars were because nobody had the courage to drive them at full speed. Um, but the, the Stanley steam engine held the land speed like record for, for I, don't, I, I don't know, maybe a dozen years at a speed that was over 200 miles an hour. Well, the biggest disadvantage of the steam car was it took a long time to get it started in the morning. Yeah, he said <laughs> it took him a minimum of 30 seconds to start moving and a minimum of, I'm trying to think of how many, it might have been five minutes. Me from scratch? Yeah. 30 seconds? <coughs> he said that the, the pilot light under the under the boiler was always going, so the boiler was always the boiler warm. was always hot. Yeah, oh, you okay. never shut that pilot light off, partly because uh, you, you, if if you left it in freezing cold weather and it froze, you'd have a problem. Big time, yeah. Yeah, right. but it took five minutes to get a full head of steam, and he said the boiler in them was about the size of a grapefruit can. Was it really? Yeah, it was very small. No wonder. It, that's why. That's why. Warmed yeah. up quickly. Okay, we should move on. Yeah. Our next item is from Power Engineering International. Blow for Indian coal as distributors opt to wait on storage and renewables. You know, this is a far more important this is item an important thing. Than, yep. than I think a lot of people would realize just hearing it. Instead of the traditional 25-year deals, Indian power distributors are negotiating 10-year agreements with coal power, power providers. The distributors believe the development of renewables and storage makes long-term agreements redundant because solar and wind have become the country's least expensive power resources. Now, what does this mean? Among other things, it means that, uh, that when a, co a company builds a coal-burning power plant, it's going to have to excuse building it for a 10-year life. And that means nobody's going to build one. Nobody's going to build one, right? You know. The takeaway here, this is from the article. <coughs> in the next five to 10 years, battery storage may be coming in a big way. Well, it will be. Yeah. And as alternatives to battery that we'll be talking about at the end. Yes, <laughs> which, by the way, has ha, has a reference backwards to that that vertical takeoff and landing oh, does it really? craft. Well, of course, just think about that Lamborghini battery, which yeah, isn't a yeah, battery, yeah. And, and and these yeah, vertical yeah. engines. You're talking about something where the, the world changes. This, this, this is something I have a hard time wrapping my mind around. Absolutely. Yeah. I do, too. So uh, we, I said battery storage may be coming in a big way. Longer-term power contracts have all but disappeared in the last two years, except in the clean energy segment. <laughs> now, this is the Indian PM, Prime Minister Modi, targets almost tripling renewables capacity to 175 gigawatts by 2022. This yeah. is India. Yeah, this they're is India. They're catching up to the real world. Well, you know, they're, what they're catching up to is China. Yeah. And, and the United States is not even making we're, an attempt to check. Back, we're not even looking. <clears throat> Donald Trump has given given American credibility and given American leadership to China. It's well, just we'll been talk donated. We'll talk later too. Okay. And this, this is a final takeaway here. Yeah. There are currently 25 gigawatts. That's a lot. Yeah. Of coal-fired power generating capacity stranded and unused in India. It's built and they're not using it. I, yeah. 25 that, gigawatts. That ain't, that ain't hey, guys. Well, that's what, about 40 Vermont Yankee nuclear power plants? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
That's, and that, that's a lot of money because those plants are not cheap to build. They're cheaper than, than nuclear, but not enough to, that you can just write that off and have uh, no consequences. Well, coming back home, South Dakota Keystone Pipeline shut down after oil spill. And we'll be this talking about for, more about this yeah, at the end. This is from Anadolu, Anadolu Agency. It's Turkish. You know, yes, it is. <laughs> this is. I mean, these stories get published all over the all world. All over the world. TransCanada announced that it has shut down the Keystone Pipeline in South Dakota because it discovered 210,000 gallons of oil had spilled from the pipeline. The state of Nebraska will decide next week, and of course this was over last week. It was last week, and it's already made the decision. If it will allow a stretch of Keystone Pipeline to be built through the state, waterways or wildlife areas appear not to have been impacted. This particular um, this is the existing pipeline. Yeah, the, this is the existing pipeline, which is already in operation. The Keystone XL pipeline is just to shorten it. And, okay. And um, uh, the the um, break happened in a in a, a section of pipe that was underground. Okay. So uh, one thing that that tells you, I think, is, is not likely to be vandalism. This is the pipe just breaking. It just failed. It failed. Well, the the oil that they're pumping through these pipelines is carbonated. Yeah, right. I it mean, is. it's literally carbonated, yeah. and, it, and it's acid, and it's got sand uh, in it. Sand and stuff. It's in. extremely this is not abrasive. Easy stuff not to, easy to, to pump. pump around. And you know, I saw a picture of the area where the break was, and the the vegetation above the break was all black. Now, I don't know if that's because there were oil or because somebody wanted to show you, show the people looking whether where the break was in the photograph, but I think you know. They, they knew the break was there because they could see that the pressure had dropped. Yeah. yeah. Well, they got all sorts of sensors for They've that. got all sorts of sensors, yeah. Okay, we're up to Saturday, November 18th, and we have an item here from the BBC News well, and a qu picture. Quick takeaway on the last one from, oh, okay. from the Sierra Club. This is not the first time TransCanada's pipeline has spilled toxic tar sands, and it won't be the last. Well, we have breaks, major breaks in the United States that go largely unnoticed by the press. And they happen uh, fairly frequently. They're every oh, couple yeah. of months. You, it's no longer news. It's no longer news. That's right. And if you have an eight-inch pipeline breaking, and and it spills something all over the place, it's not even it's not even regarded as consequential unless it gets into the water system for for New Orleans or something like that. But um, they they don't really report a lot of these things. Well, let's move on. Okay, our next item is from BBC News, and we have a beautiful picture of a questionable object. <laughs> <laughs> it's an offshore oil rig. It is an it offshore is. oil rig, yeah. And it's in Norway. Yeah. From Norsk Old J. <laughs> Dogots. <laughs> yeah, okay. I can't speak English. What's the title for this one, Tom? Norway State Fund Needs to Drop Oil and Gas Investments. Norway's government has been told its state-run fund would, should drop its investments in oil and gas stocks worth 28 billion pounds, which is $37 billion. Norge's bank, and that's pronounced badly, I'm sure, but nevertheless, <laughs> I'll just go on. The fund's manager said the st step would make the country, quote, less vulnerable to a per uh, per permanent drop in oil and gas prices, unquote. The advice is based on a price forecast, um, for, is not based on a price forecast or the se sector's sustainability. Now, what they're saying is they expect a permanent drop in oil and gas prices. Well, at 55 cents a barrel. Dollars. 55 dollars a barrel. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. It's, it's no longer worth it to pump oil from places like the tar stands. Yeah, which means it's marginal right now. Keystone XL has been having trouble finding people who want to pump oil through. Exactly. It. Yep. And um, for that very reason, at fifty-five dollars a barrel. But the the thing that they're anticipating, I suspect, is that the demand for oil will go down faster than the supply. So they expect the the price of oil will continue to be low. 
And I think it I've, seems that way. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here in Brattleboro, so. Yeah, and what I've been t saying, and I've said this on the show before, is I expect that the price of oil will go down at the wellhead, will go up at the pump, and the people who are dealing the oil in between, who are paying less for it and charging more for it, will be making less money. Because it doesn't the, seem like it makes sense. It's a matter of inefficiency. The whole system becomes inefficient as uh -huh. the, as the amount process as the declines. Amount drops. Yep. And you know, if you think at this from a strictly engineering point of view, uh, and I was an engineer once, <laughs> <laughs> it it makes a certain amount of sense that you could have that happen. They will pay more to process smaller amounts of oil. Okay. It doesn't look, look like it's a good investment right now. No, I, 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 th that's something that I would stay strictly out of, absolutely out of. And by the way, these things, yeah. these little computers, yeah. you can't buy into the company that makes them. Oh, you can? No, huh? it's a charity. <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> yes. It's the third biggest selling computer in the world, and the people making it are a nonprofit organization that was put together to make computers for education in, the, in Wales. Oh, you darn. That's interesting. Very Don't interesting. you love it? Yeah. Well, okay. Let's move along here. Power Engineering International. 6,900 jobs go at Siemens Power Division as the market burns to the ground. <laughs> as the market it's just burns what we were talking ground. about. Yeah. Siemens is to release 2% of its global workforce, mainly in Germany, as its power and gas division continues to suffer from the onslaught of clean energy expansion. Quote, the market is burning to the ground, end quote, Siemens board member um, Janina Kugel said. She is the, in charge of human resources. Uh, yes? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is a quote from the article. The power generation industry is experiencing disruption of unprecedented scope and speed. Yeah, well. Renewables are putting other forms of power generation under increasing pressure. Now that's a quote from Siemens. Yeah. And just a takeaway here, half of the expected job cuts in this article will be made in Germany. Yeah, but almost all of them are being made in, in divisions of Siemens that are, well, power and gas. Power and gas, yeah. And it's, it's like they're talking about the, the f divisions that are using fossil fuel. And when they're talking about power and gas, they're not talking about power. They're not talking in, about renewables. About renewables, they're no. not talking about wind power. Oh, not, these are turbines that they're. These are turbines yeah. that are being used for for generating power from fossil fuels. Turbin, Interesting. Turbines are interesting. You can use them for generating power from fossil fuels, nuclear. Doesn't renewables. matter as long as you get steam. As, you don't even need steam. To run a turbine. Water. Huh? Yeah, water. water Wind. Sure. sure, right. You know anything that'll mm -hmm. make something go around. Yeah. Okay, our next item is from MassLive.com. Eversource, a company, mm -hmm. wins federal permit for major New Hampshire, New Hampshire transmission line to serve Massachusetts utilities. Now, th this is not a given that the line will go in. No, they got a permit, but uh, th this is a competition. Yeah. A major New England transmission line planned by Eversource Energy and Hydro-Quebec has won a presidential permit from the U.S. DOE. The federal permit marks a significant milestone for the 1.6 billion 162 mile Northern Pass, which was first proposed in 2010. The line would carry electricity from Canada to New England, to the New England power grid. And the reason they needed this presidential permit is because they were- It crosses a border. Right. Yeah, crosses it's, an international border. Yeah. Well, as, as I just mentioned, this is one of several competing proposals We've talked about these. I thought they were all separate uh, existing pipeline or transmission lines, but they're not. These guys are fighting for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the winners, <laughs> there's, there's money involved. Yeah. They're going to gain multi billion dollar contracts for a period of 20 years. Yes. So this, is, this, is this is pretty a, significant. This is a big deal. And we've talked about these lines before. Northern Pass is not the only one of them. It, it could never be built simply because. The bidder, the winning bidder, is a different uh, uh, project, and one of these things goes from what is it, Nova Scotia to Plymouth, Massachusetts, underwater. Yeah, well, there's one of them goes under Lake Champlain. One goes under okay, Lake another Champlain. Another one uh, goes from Central Maine Power. I think that's the one that goes down into uh, Cape Cod. 
I think the one from Central Maine goes to Boston. I thought the one that came from no, from New Brunswick or Nova Scotia. Well, there's another one going to going to Nova Scotia, and yeah. that goes to Plymouth. That one's going to Plymouth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but Plymouth is an obvious place because Plymouth is closing down. They're going to have uh, electric connections the for connections a lot of are power. There. Yep. They're there. Sort of so like the, the distribution. The Yankees. Yeah. Backyard right now. Distribution from that point is a is a is a real. So it'd be interesting to watch and see which which one happens. It will. This we, northern pass is 200 miles. It goes from the junction of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Canada, mm -hmm. right up. It goes all the way down to Manchester. Manchester, New Hampshire. New Hampshire, yeah. yeah. Vicinity of Manchester. Yeah. Okay, we have an article from Clean Technica next. Investors now better able to cl to gauge climate risk in investments. This is, this is about software, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Investors are now better able to gauge the climate risks likely to impact their investments thanks to a new risk management tool developed by Deutsche Asset Management and 427, published for COP23, which, and if anybody can understand that sentence, congratulations, <laughs> which maps more than a million physical <laughs> cooperative corporate locations along climate models um, alongside climate models to assess their climate risk so what they're doing is they're saying if you're interested in for example uh, investing in energy you can tell us here's you're interested in energy and then we can give you various climate models and tell you how much damage is done to that company under each climate model that's worth knowing it is. If you've got yeah. some money to invest, that's worth knowing a lot. If you've got money to invest, yes. By the way, this COP23, we've been talking about it without mentioning it by name, and we've yeah. been mentioning it by name what, what it is. COP means Conference of the Parties, whatever that means. Well, it's But it just ended in Bonn. It's just, yeah, it this did. This was just over about a week ago. Yeah. This is a conference of parties, and it's involved in um, the, the, the climate change, um, greenhouse gases, and so forth. And of course, um, Donald Trump sent his representative, who told everybody that they should invest in coal. You know, I think we're going to be talking about that later, aren't we? Yeah, I think we are. Yeah. It's it's a disgrace. <laughs> it's really, I mean, basically what he's done is he's making America great. Yeah, make it last. America is the last place company, country rather. We're the only country in the world that has taken a position that it really shouldn't do anything. I think you're right. And, well, we'll, we'll talk you know, about that a little bit more. So we've got other countries that ha are more highly regarded than ours, and China happens to be one of them. Well, again, we're going to be talking about exactly that. Sunday, <laughs> November 19th, we have a cornfield nice with an here. ethanol plant and a, an article from Wisconsin State Farmer. Ethanol production can increase global warming, huh? What? <laughs> a study showed that Wisconsin ra ranked in ninth place for carbon dioxide releases due to farming practices. Converting unused land to produce crops for ethanol production releases a lot of carbon dioxide from the soil. The authors said most of the state's new farmland had previously been pastures or forests or in some cases wetlands. This is second-order consequences I don't think anybody was even thinking of, or if they were, they weren't talking about it. Carbon that is stored in the soil is released into the atmosphere when it's plowed. Yeah. Okay, unintended consequences of federal policy meant to reduce America's reliance on fossil fuels. This ethanol didn't work. Thing. No, <laughs> and, and there have been various people along the way who have said, wait a minute, it takes a gallon of gasoline to run the equipment that's required to... Uh, produce a gallon of ethanol. Why are we making ethanol? And then, you know, I had a Prius. I could give you an answer. Archer Daniels Midland. Might be. <laughs> and, you know, I had a Prius and I could keep track of the mileage on that car. Yeah. When I could no longer buy 100% gasoline and had to buy 10% ethanol. The makes, mileage went down. The mileage went down by 10%, yeah. which meant that there was no savings at all. No, no net gain. No, there was no gain at all. It was, it was pure loss. And now we're being told it, it is worse than it looked at that time. So, okay. <laughs> Did they know? <laughs> I, I have no idea. You know, people are, theory. Pe people are so involved in their own p 
pocketbooks that they they most people are in denial about this kind of stuff. The people who are are affected by it, the people who invest in Arthur Dan Daniels Midland, are not going to admit that any of this is happening. No. Any more than people in Exxon Mobil are going to be admitting that c climate change is the way that their own scientists said it was. <laughs> Okay, should we move on? Yeah, this is an interesting article, From too. the Indian Express. Nickel-based catalyst able to recycle carbon dioxide and methane and control climate change. This is kind of cool, but it's, this, you know, there's many of these, but... Th this is still laboratory stuff. Yeah, this but is laboratory. But there's a lot of guys working in their labs Absolutely. doing work on this kind of stuff. Yeah. A, a cost-effective catalyst has been developed to recycle two of the main causes behind climate change, carbon dioxide and methane. In a study published in the journal Applied Catalysts B Environmental, scientists have described how they created an, an advanced nickel-based catalyst to create synthesis gas for fuel or chemical feedstock. Now, I want to I want to tell people in case they don't know, a catalyst is something that enhances or promotes or causes yeah. or allows a chemical reaction that would not otherwise take place. It helps a reaction go. Yeah, yeah. but it's not part of the reaction, so you don't it's, use it it's, up. It's not Exactly, it's not damaged by the reaction. You use it over again. Yeah, and what is, um, is happening here is they've got um, a nickel-based catalyst that will take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, if that's where you're going to get it, take methane out of the atmosphere, and they're going to use that to produce synthesis gas. Okay. And synthesis gas can be used as a fuel, or it can be used as a feedstock for making a variety of things. Such well, as it's unnatural natural gas. It is. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, right. Okay, a, a quick takeaway here. We're talking, this is basically carbon capture technology. Yes. And they say, well, carbon capture technology is common. It is expensive, and in most cases requires extreme and precise conditions for the process to be successful. And it's hoping that this new catalyst will make the technology more widely available, easier, and cheaper. Right. Okay, so again, there's a lot of people working on some There's a lot ideas. of people, that's right. Okay, our next article, article is from Clean Technica. We have a picture of a city bus. We have a picture of a city bus in uh, Manhattan. It's coming up here. And it looks very unremarkable. Unre looks like a bus. It looks like a bus. <laughs> BYD, which, by the way, is short for Build Your Dreams. <laughs> it really is. Yes. BYD is a Chinese the, company. Yeah, which uses an English uh, acronym yeah. for its name. Opening an electric truck factory in Canada. Yeah. And it cites a friendly environment for EVs in Canada than in the U.S. China, a Chinese electric uh, vehicle manufacturer, BYD, will be opening its first assembly facility in Canada ne next year in Ontario. This is in, in anticipation of surging demand for electric buses in the country. The country has revealed BYD chose to move into Canada because it has a friendlier environment for EVs than the U.S. currently has. And you well, know... There's a little more going on. They're getting strong provincial tax incentives. Oh, yeah, they're getting incentives there. And <laughs> the United States is not going to give them incentives. The, the Trump administration doesn't want electric buses running all over the United States. But, you know, we talked about this last week. The city of Shen, Sh Shenzhen, which, again, I'm pronouncing badly, sorry about that, um, has 12,000 electric buses. That's one city in, in, in China. We talked about that or, or last week. Yeah. And, yeah. and the United States, the last time I looked, had about 300 for the whole country. For the whole country, yeah. And, you know, I think Burlington is getting a couple of them, and, and, and uh, I think possibly uh, it's token stuff. Hanover. These guys are going in with Well, feet it's on. token for BYD. It's yeah. important for Burlington because it saves a lot of money. But the problem is that these buses cost a great deal more than a normal bus because they've got to have all the batteries. They've got to have all the charging equipment. They've got to have the motors. They've got to have all that stuff which right now costs more than the internal combustion engine, which, by the way, are diesel engines, so they are cheap to manufacture. So there you have it. Um, 
looking at some of my notes here, and I'll, I'll pass on it. Okay. <laughs> we are up to the Peninsula Cutter, which, by the way, is pronounced is spelled Q-A-T-A-R, but I'm told it's Cutter. It's close, closer to Gutter. Gutter. Okay. Close to it. The, the, the Arabic Q is almost a G. Oh, okay. Almost. I, I know that the vowels <laughs> are almost almost interchangeable. You, I see Arab names, and they they have an they, O or an A or an I or an E. You know, they it's, they only write the long vowels. They don't even bother to write and the, the different short ones. the different um, dialects mm -hmm. pronounce things mm -hmm. differently. So, well, let's move on. No, let's not. We Hydrogen <laughs> can cut twenty percent of CO two emissions targets by twenty fifty. Hydrogen Council Coalition launched its first quantified study of the role of hydrogen developed with support of McKinsey and Company. Remember the McKinsey report? I remember, I remember Ella Fitzgerald singing about it. <laughs> it shows... That was McKinsey, not McKinsey. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, it shows that hydrogen would, could generate $2.5 trillion worth of business, creating more than 30 million a million jobs by 2050 and it could account for almost 20 percent of final energy consumed by then hydrogen who to thunk i don't know i don't know well when you burn hydrogen there's no co2 emissions that's true <laughs> interesting yeah this would reduce annual co2 emissions by roughly six gigatons and contribute roughly 20% of the abatement required to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius. There you go. So this could... This is could, significant. This and, is very and big. you can buy hydrogen now for your car in California. There's, there's yes. Hydrogen stations. Yes, and there are f there's fuel cell technology that allows f for hydrogen to be made from electricity or for electricity to be made from hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So, you know... Anyway, well, there you, you have it. If you use solar to generate hydrogen, you now have portable solar. Right. Right. That sound was something coming up in the news. <laughs> it's something coming up in the news, not, not pertinent to here. Yep. So let's get We are up to Monday, up. November 20th, and I think this is one of the prettiest pictures we've seen. Ah, oh, that's, that's pretty neat. Isn't it? Really pretty neat. An, is an, that in Antarctica or do you know? Or? I don't know. It's a NASA picture and, um, you know, it's not taken from a satellite. That's all I can tell you. I'm pretty sure it's not taken from a satellite. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> pretty interesting picture in any case. Yeah. This is a nice long article here. There's a lot yes. of stuff in it if you've got some time. Yes. We should be on the offensive. James Hansen calls for a wave of climate lawsuits. And we started talking we've, about that. We've talked about this a bunch of times. One of the fathers of climate science is calling for a wave of lawsuits against governments and fuel, uh, fossil fuel companies that are delaying action on what he describes as the growing mortal threat of, of global warming. Former NASA scientist James Hansen says the litigation to mitigate, litigate to mitigate campaign is needed alongside political mobilization. And yeah, I think these people should have their feet held to the fire. Well, the premise that he's, up, he's arguing about, and others are doing the same thing, they're, they're uh, arguing that the government's failure to curb CO2 emissions has violated the youngest generation's constitutional rights to LLP. And, <laughs> so and you know, the, the Supreme Court has Life, said- Life, liberty, and property. Yeah. The, the, light, the Supreme Court has, has already ruled, it did, oh, I think, 10 years ago, that carbon dioxide emissions are dangerous and have to be uh, regulated by the EPA. So he's, he's got something to grasp up with this lawsuit. And if it starts costing money, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits. There's like good, yes, there will be. And this is something that I think could be um, very important. Okay. Our next item is from Bloomberg. They always have some good stuff. Yes, they do. China on stride for record solar power installations. Mind-blowing. China, yes. the world's biggest carbon emitter, is poised to, poised, to, poised to install a record amount of solar power capacity this year, prompting researchers to boost forecasts by as much as 80%. 
About 54 gigawatts of solar power will be put in place this year, Bloomberg New Energy Finance said, raising a forecast of more than 30 gigawatts um, that was made by BNEF um, last July. So that's Bluebird. That's, BNEF is Bluebird. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So there's, last July, they said they expected 30 gigawatts to be installed. Now they're saying 54, 54. gigawatts. And this is, you know, China is installing more renewable energy than the rest of the world put together. Well, the now that, I think, <laughs> is a socialist plot. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to this article, and we'll talk about it again, China has been the world's biggest solar market since 2013. Yeah. And they're and not playing games. They're putting the United States in the dust in this market. And why are they doing that? Well, five years from now, they're going to be, they're going to be really energy independent which means that we're not going to be able to put a whole lot of pressure on them and get anything done. Yeah. But they can put pressure on us. Yeah. So what is the United States Maybe doing by, ready now. by ignoring this? The United States is putting the American military in a disadvantage, the American economy at a disadvantage, American business at a disadvantage, the and American why? consumer and at a disadvantage. Why? Because there's a couple of guys in Kansas who make money and don't want to stop making money. There you go. You know, I mean, <laughs> I know about Kansas. I was born there. Right across the street from that farm that, that, that Dorothy lived on with her little dog. Oh, is that so? <laughs> remember, remember Toto? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Well, Should we go on? Here. Our next item is from Energy Infra Post. Floating solar panels at Ujani, if I can mispronounce it, dam, save water and generate power. It is a picture of the dam. There's it's a picture a of the, dam. That's a big dam. In order to prevent... Damn big dam. Yeah. In order... To, it shouldn't say things like that. <laughs> and in order to prevent mass scale evaporation of water, the state government of Maharashtra has given a nod to a proposal that involves setting up floating solar panels on a reservoir at, at Ujani Dam. The solar panels will be set on the water surface of 4,640 acres to generate 1,000 megawatts of electricity, making it one of the largest projects of its type. This is interesting. That's, by the way, seven square miles. Yeah. So this is a big dam, this a, is a big, big project. Dam. That's right. And a quick takeaway here. It's one of the largest water reservoirs in the state. That's the state of Maharashtra. Yeah. And it's used for irrigation and drinking water. Yeah. Not used for hydro. Right. Okay? At least up until now. The dam is located in an area where temperatures are high and the sunlight exposure causes evaporation. Yeah. So they're going to be putting these panels down. It's going to cut that down. It's going to make the panels, and make the panels more efficient better. because it, it, the water will cool them off. them off. So every year the dam uses over 250 billion gallons of water yeah. through evaporation. And the solar power will be linked to the state's power grid. Okay, we are up to an article from Perth Now. Perth Now? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> we're still on Monday, November 20th, rather. Yeah, we are. So we're getting close to the end here, guys. Yeah. Australia's energy market. New report black. New, <laughs> new report backs labor's 50% renewable target. Australia's chief scientists contradict the government's claims that, the, that Labor's 50% renewables target by 2030 is a road to ruin. Dr. Alan Finkel is issuing a major report that shows the plan for more renewable energy sources will not lead to major blackouts, despite the government's claim that the huge renewable target is irresponsible and crazy. And, you know... Well, what we got going here in Australia is the federal government's big supporter of, of fossil coal. fuels. Yeah. And the state governments are looking at reality. Yep. And in Australia, it's happening so fast they can't even count them. People are voluntarily putting solar on their roofs. Australia has the largest percentage of people with solar on their roofs of any country in the world. I can believe that. Well, they got so a lot of sun. They have a lot of sun, and people are putting batteries, uh, batteries into their homes, and the the power companies are running into trouble. And some of the states are very much behind renewable energy, Victoria being one, um, uh, New South Wales being another. The, the, um, 
capital district. The federal district, yeah. yeah. Is, They're Washington, D.C. Yes, that's another one. So we are up to Tuesday, November 21st, with an article from Huff Post, the Huffington this the Post. Last, this is the last article we're going to talk about, isn't it? No, I don't think so. I got three more after this. No, I mean the last day. Last day, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tuesday, <laughs> November 21st. That's right. I got Tuesday, November 21st down here twice. Do you? <laughs> well, that makes it special. Let's start for one of them. Okay. Let's, let's take, take care of one of them. Okay. China's, just what we were talking about. Yep. China's solar revolution is outpacing the U.S. energy boom. This is a good article. Yep. If, Every, if you're interested in energy, read this article. Yeah. There's a lot of meat in it. These guys did their homework. Every hour, Chinese workers install an array of solar panels at least the size of a soccer field, already home to the world's largest every solar hour. plant every hour, and floating solar installations. Over half of the world's current construction on solar power installations is taking place in China. Meanwhile, others, including the United States, are increasingly fall be falling behind. Now, Donald Trump is saying the reason the Chinese are saying that climate change is real is because they want to force the Americans to get into renewable power to put them at a at a competitive disadvantage. Meanwhile, <laughs> they are c installing renewable energy faster than the rest of the smile. world put and together. Which I mean, just the two of those show you that the people in Washington have got no clue what they're talking about. There's a paragraph here that kind of sums up what these guys are saying. I hope we got enough time yeah. to read it. China stands at the top of global investment in and production and exports of solar panels and other renewable energy systems. China's lead in renewables cannot be ignored. Bankrolling clean energy projects across the developing world gives China an edge, pushing countries to buy from Chinese companies and turn to Chinese leadership. Okay, just what you were talking about. Th this has substantial implications for the United States. Duh. Duh, yeah. <laughs> China's economic and geopolitical gains come at the United States' expense. Right. Advocating a lead in clean energy to this major competitor risks the United States' long-term prospects as an energy powerhouse and leader in the global economic order. Not only economic, but also military. I mean, basically scientific. We've got a lot of places here where we're at a disadvantage because of, of denial. Bingo. Coupled with its retreat from sustainable energy goals, sustainable climate goals, the United States has opened a vacuum in economic leadership that rising powers such as China are all the more willing to enable to fill. The U.S. now needs to play catch up. That's right. We should move on. Our next article is from the Houston, or from the from the Houston Chronicle. I'll settle for Houston. Houston. <laughs> in New York, it's called Houston. Yeah, I thought it was called Houston in Houston. <laughs> Let's just go. We, we'll forget that one. Okay. <laughs> Let's get the picture up. Let's here get first. the picture up there. I'm having dyslexia here. There we go. Victory for Keystone XL, but will Trans Canada build the pipeline? Obstacles remain. N Nebraska officials voted to allow the Keystone XL pipeline to cross state, the state, a key step toward completion of the Keystone pipeline network. The state's Public Surface Commission voted three to two in favor of the pipeline expansion days after the existing Keystone pipeline spilled 210,000 gallons of oil in South Dakota. Yeah, it's only 210,000. <coughs> Yeah, what the heck? <laughs> that's it's only in South Dakota. This is Nebraska. Yeah, that's only twenty, uh, forty of those big tr tractor trailers. Excuse me. Um, those pipes are pretty big, aren't they? The the pipes are big. Yeah. The stakes are big. Inches. The whole the whole thing is big, and uh, you know I'm I wouldn't invest in this. I I I, I find <laughs> it hard to imagine that it's actually going to going to pay well, for that's itself. Basically, ever. what this article is saying, it, it may not happen. Just for those who haven't been paying attention, the pipeline ships heavy crude oil from oil sands in western Canada to refineries along the Gulf Coast. Yeah, you might remember that about a year, uh, a year ago, yeah, it was, it was um, a, over a year ago, well, um, a year and a half ago, Rex Tillerson told the people at ExxonMobil, don't worry about stranded assets. Our assets are not going to be stranded. 
And it was a couple of months after that that ExxonMobil told its stockholders that it was having to write off 2.2 billion barrels of oil in Canada. And that's what's Strange being shipped. Essence. That's what's being shipped through this pipeline, yeah. is that kind of oil that ExxonMobil wrote off completely. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Our next item is from DC, uh, I'm sorry, is from vtdigger.org. I've got a quick takeaway here. Oh, go ahead. This, came, this, this just came from something I got in an email today. Oh, really? It's related to this, but it's not from this article. Okay. Last month, 84 members of Congress, including four Democrats from Texas, signed a letter to Attorney General Jeff Sessions asking whether domestic terrorism laws could be used to prosecute individuals shutting down oil pipelines. Huh. This is scary. Yes, it's well. an anticipation of the Keystone XL's construction. Legislation was passed in South Dakota that allows a governor or a local sheriff to prohibit groups numbering more than 20 from gathering on public land or in schools. They're going to fight back. Groups of more than 20, 20. to get? So what happens to the PTA? Well, they have to enforce. That's not automatic. It's they not, get to choose who they They get to them. choose, <laughs> yeah. Well, just remember, <clears throat> according to the federal terrorism laws, if you vandalize terror, federal property, that is terrorism, terrorism. Yep. which means that if you take a, a can of spray paint and, and paint a big dollar sign on the side of a post box, you are a terrorist. Yeah, technically you are. This, I have very little respect for lawmakers who write that kind of junk. Well, anyway. what, they're, what they're definitely trying to do is stop opposition to these pipelines. Yep. And the, the opposition, it's having the opposite effect. Yeah. The opposition is growing. Yeah. We have to move on. Got, Our next item is from VT Digger, and um, that's about coming the, back home. Middlebury College. Middlebury College looks to food waste and, and manure as a new energy source. Middlebury, this is an interesting article. Yeah, Middlebury College, they've been at this for a long time. It's not oh, yeah. entirely new, but this is a new twist on it. Middlebury College will significantly reduce its carbon footprint thanks to an innovative partnership with Goodrich Family Farm in Salisbury, Vermont, Vanguard Renewables of Wellesley, Massachusetts, and Vermont Gas. A facility at Good Goodrich Family Farm will combine the cow manure and food waste, waste to produce renewable natural gas. So, you know, a while, one very <coughs> long ago, I noticed that Vermont Gas was running a pipeline down in Middlebury. Yeah. And I was saying to myself, why? Yeah. Well, they knew this was coming. They, this and other things. Yeah. And, and they, but this is also the reason why, although environmentalists in general have been very much opposed to this pipeline, and Middlebury College is very environmentally oriented. They're very environmentally oriented, friendly. They supported the pipeline because it would give them renewable natural gas. So, and they're getting some, this renewable natural gas from, a, from the Gertrude farm. Yeah, which as I recall... Which is a big is, farm, 900 milking cows. But it's, it's, quite, it's a number of miles away, and the only other alternative is to bring it down in a truck, which is not exactly... Not cheap. No. Uh, um, okay, we should and move on. Dish, well, Go we, ahead. We, we, I want to talk about the, about the last article. The last article. <laughs> in addition to the uh, renewable energy... Yeah. The facility will create high-quality liquid fertilizer yeah, for the farm. Absolutely, it's a win-win situation. Yes. Well, let's move along. Lamborghini. We have a we have a, a we photograph here. A picture here. here. We got a of a Lamborghini. And you'd say, why why do we have a photograph of a Lamborghini? <laughs> this is from Energy Digital. Lamborghini introduces <clears throat> its first electric car. MIT and Lamborghini have partnered to develop an electric car. The, the Terzo Millennio is, third millennium. Third millennium is powered by using supercapacitors instead of batteries, allowing it to charge faster and hold more power. The vehicle can in, induce, its own, uh, health in, induce its own health check, and if any damage is de detected, the car can fill in the cracks with nanotubes. And <laughs> interestingly enough... So it's a plastic-bodied car. 
Yeah, and the and the and the the equivalent of the ba battery is high in the body. It's because, built into the body because the capacitors are so light. Yeah. That you know, and I'm looking at this and saying we may be looking at an entirely new approach to energy storage technology. Oh, for cars. I think so. I I read, read this article. I said, wow, you know, this is this is new. MIT and, and Lamborghini. Now, how, did, did you catch when this car was expected to be produced? We it's have way to, over my head. We have to go, so we should get a picture of ourselves up so that I can why not? wave why not? to everybody, and you can wave and to I everybody. Wave. And, bye. <laughs> Adios. See you next time. Yeah.